Hey guys, this is just a quick rundown of Deborah Brandt's Sponsors of Literacy. This is not a replacement for the reading. This is just me kind of talking about some of the main points that might be a little confusing. So the definition for sponsorship, or sponsors rather, sponsors as I have come to think of them are any agents, local or distant, concrete or abstract, who enable, support, teach, model, as well as recruit, regulate, suppress, or withhold literacy, and gain advantage by it in some way. So, what does that mean? The example that she uses is that television shows are brought to us by advertisers, right? Um, BuzzFeed writes, um, writes advertisements, hidden ads, that look like articles. Same sort of thing. They bring us content commercially. Um, Google does the same thing with Google Ads, um, AdSense. We are the product when we're online, right? So, when they're talking about, con when she's talking about concrete sponsors, that's things that are like very, very obvious and very, very physically there. Teachers, school systems, churches, uh, workplaces, right? Learning how to write a good business memo is a form of literacy and it's sponsored by your workplace and they are gaining something out of it, the ability for you to do a good job. The school system is gaining something out of you too if you learn to read and write. They might be gaining more funding um, with higher test scores and in the grand scheme of things, they are making people who will have the skills to work and contribute money to the economy and to taxes. So, you know, there's, there's always sort of that economic um, impetus behind that economic drive behind any sort of sponsorship um, situation. Like, I do not teach out of the goodness of my heart, necessarily. At the end of the day, it is a job, right? Same thing for, like, your first grade teacher, even though for her or him, it might have been more of a my heart's in it type thing, right? Um, so even though the interests of the sponsor and the sponsored don't have to be the same and can very often conflict. Um, sponsors nevertheless set the terms for literacy and wield powerful incentives for compliance and, li and uh, loyalty. So in a university setting or a school setting, that's grades. In a religious setting, that's the threat of excommunication or the promise of salvation in whatever form, right? Um, there are these very powerful mechanisms at play. In a workplace, it's, hey, you can be fired, you can be disciplined, you can be this, you can be that. So there's always sort of these forces and these power structures kind of trying to keep us in line and it's, it gets a little messy, um, but the big sponsors that we deal with are our churches. Um, Protestant England Sunday schools were some of the first places to teach reading um, in Europe because people needed to read the Bible, and then those very same people who discovered how useful reading was um, for upward social mobility also ask for instruction in writing and math and people running those Sunday schools freaked out a little bit because that's a lot of power. Um, same story with slave Sunday schools too. They wanted to teach slaves to read the Bible so that they could read the stories about, you know, good slave master relationships, good slave master relationships, and they turned into, uh, sites of rebellion sometimes, so they were very often shut down. 
But not always, because if you can control the flow of information, you can actually get a very, a much more compliant group of people. Not to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but there is some of that going on in sort of a sponsorship relationship. Um, there's also the concept of sponsorship and access. So if you're sponsored by a certain group of people, or if you know a certain person, right, you can maybe have more opportunities than another person. So Raymond and Dora were in the same place at the same time, but they knew different people and they had different resources sort of at their family's fingertips. So their sponsorships to literacy looked very different. Um, and they both ended up in very different places based on the resources that they were pulling from. Um, and then there's also this concept of literacy standards as well. So as the world has changed, the standards of what it means to be a good reader and a good writer have also shifted because we've gone from a manufacturing thing-making, thing-swapping society to an information-making and service-swapping society. So it's a lot more retail jobs and IT teaching technical stuff, right? Um, in, in this society. And as part of that, a lot of the literacy that we've needed to acquire is a lot more technical and a lot more legal, right? So learning how to read terms of use has suddenly become a thing people need to do. Learning how to distinguish uh, fake news from real news. That's something that has become increasingly more important. Those are sort of the increase over time of literacy standards from about post-World War II to now, right? Things have really utterly and completely changed um, based on technology and the sorts of jobs that everyone does. There's also this concept of appropriation where you take a skill that you learn and you put it somewhere else. So let's say you learn how to write a very good memo for work, right? And your church needs a secretary. <laughs> so suddenly you're using those writing skills in a religious context. Oh boy, that is not what your sponsor, your work sponsor, um, really thought that they should, that they were going to do when they gave you these tools. They weren't making you a better Seventh-day Adventist. They were making you a better employee. Um, but it ended up making you a better Seventh-day Adventist, too. Um, you can also take literacy skills and, like some of those slaves did, apply it to more radical ends. You know. So you can take things that were taught to you for a certain purpose and twist them around to your own purposes, religious, radical, um, personal, or otherwise, um, in ways that are very, very interesting and in ways that kind of change the, the dynamic a bit. Now, in terms of sponsorship, I've been talking in terms of like positive sponsors, sponsors that give you things. So there are also negative sponsors. So, like, the prison system could be considered a sponsor for some people um, because there are libraries there and they get a lot of free time, yet no one wants to be a prisoner despite the fact that it might have a good effect on their literacy. Um, and there's a lot of gatekeeping there, too. Um, there's also a lot of restriction with sponsors, right? You can't ask any question or seek any kind of knowledge, it, it's pretty limited. Um, but generally speaking, 
sponsorship is this very odd, like, non-concrete idea, but it is essentially the people who and the things that made it so that you could learn a skill. So you could say that your pencil is a sponsor, right? Or I'm sponsored by LaCroix. I get very, very thirsty, so I drink a lot of sparkling water when I'm writing and reading and speaking, right? So it could be anything as simple as that or any anybody as big as Google or Jeff Bezos and Amazon's entire business structure, right? It doesn't have to be small, but it can also be a particular book that was given to you or a parent that insulted you so badly that you uh, decided to prove them wrong, right? And you learned out of spite. So that's sort of negative sponsorship too. You can be so insulted that you're like, ha, huh, I will prove them wrong. Um, hopefully that made sense and you will kind of see some stuff um, or see what I'm saying as you read along. Um, all of these examples of sponsorship that I'm sort of talking about, we will see examples of in literacy narratives that we also read. So that'll be fun. Okay. Bye.